In this video, I'm going to illustrate how data can be analyzed to try and work out what types of shapes are present within a set of spectra, all that have some relationship between each other. In this case, it's a sputter depth profile. And the relationship is that we start off with a native oxide layer, and we can see carbon here, that after sputtering, the native oxide evolves and progressively changes into a spectrum that will be representative of the metal. So the evolution from a native oxide to a metal surface provides a nice example of spectra that are broad doublet peaks, have a degree of complexity involved, and are open to analysis by the techniques that I'm going to illustrate in this video. And the ultimate goal is to try and work out a set of shapes, that is to say, component curves that represent different phases of the material that gives us some insight into what happens to this native oxide as it is etched with an iron beam. Before proceeding with the analysis, I'll make some adjustments to the display state. The first adjustment is to change the line width. I've reduced the line width because the line width alters the rate at which spectra can be plotted. So a narrower line width means that the refresh rate is quicker. So I press apply and then I see the narrower lines and the quicker refresh rate. I will also plot the data using a color scale. The colors used at the moment are just a repeat of 16 custom colors. So these colors here are the colors that I use to display these data, but this doesn't give me any impression of how the data evolves from one state to another. So I would like to see how the oxide moves progressively from the oxide through to the metal using a color scale and selecting one of these color scales and then pressing apply alters the colors used to plot the data. And then if I want to see the relationship between these colors and the colors that are indicated in the right hand side, I can display the draw key and key scale colors. I'll also plot it on the left hand side. So when I press apply, I then have a color scale that matches the display that we see in the right hand side. And we can see the evolution from the oxide through to the metal indicated by the colors as they are displayed. The approach that I'm going to use to analyze these data is to make use of options that are on the PCA property page and also on the calculator property page. The PCA property page allows me to analyze a set of spectra into principal components. That is to say, component curves that are most representative of what we see in these data ranked by order. And that's very useful because it indicates how many shapes we need to consider when we try to work out spectral shapes that would represent these data. And then I'm going to use the Generate Spectra button, which will fit component curves to these data. And in doing so, I will try to understand what is missing from the data set and how I might add further component curves that would then allow a full description of all of these spectra within the data set. And in order to do this, I'm going to make use of the different spectra button that is on the calculator property page. So first of all, I'm going to use the PCA property page and calculate a set of principal component abstract factors from these data. The number of factors that I'm going to calculate is indicated by this number here where it says factors and it's set equal to 12 initially. Now there are more than 12 spectra in this set. And the reason that I've selected 12 is simply because it's a number that I think is greater than the number of significant shapes in these data. From a naive perspective, I might think there's the oxide that I think is the native oxide to this metal and then the metal peak. So it ought to be perhaps two abstract factors that should be thrown up by this PCA calculation. However, I believe there are more than two in here. So rather than just calculating two, I'm going to calculate 12. And the idea is that the 12th abstract factor ought to look just like noise. 
and only a limited number of abstract factors will look like something that deviates from noise. So having made this decision, I can calculate abstract factors from spectra using the generate factors button. And when I press this button, the abstract factors from these spectra then appear as the process data. And if I list these in the left hand side, I can investigate which of these look like spectroscopic shapes or derivatives of spectroscopic shapes. Now the first one certainly looks like a spectroscopic shape. The second one, well that looks like a, a differential of a spectrum. So we'll say that's a shift perhaps in a spectroscopic shape. Then we have another one with peaks. This peak here looks very much like a carbon peak. And there does seem to be some relationship between this carbon peak and some negative going structures that are associated with the tungsten 4D. Now the fourth one, again we've got carbon and more shapes. And then eventually I start to see abstract factors that look like noise. So this is what I mean by shapes that are different from noise. Noise is due to the pulse counting. So we're not interested in the noise. What we're only interested in is signal that creates shapes in the data. The reason that I highlighted this carbon peak is because I believe this is only at the surface. And so for the majority of the spectra in this profile, there will be no influence from the carbon. But because we are performing a principal component analysis of these data, where there is some carbon in a limited number of spectra, the fact that they exist in these abstract factors means that it's altering the calculation of the abstract factors to accommodate this carbon. So this makes me believe that what I ought to do is rather than analyze the entire data set, I should identify spectra that do not have carbon and analyze that data set in terms of principal components. That may be more representative of the types of changes in the tungsten that I might expect as a result of the sputtering. These tungsten 4D spectra are all now process data representing these abstract factors. So I need to return the data back to the raw state. I can do this using the reset processing on the PCA property page. And then I can start looking for spectra with carbon. So if I visually inspect these data, I see the carbon peak that I was concerned about that appeared in the PCA abstract factors, the small peak here, and then pretty much the carbon is gone after 80 seconds of sputtering. So what I need to do is perhaps look at how these data respond to a principal component analysis calculation rather than including these two spectra that seem to have carbon and therefore more representative of the surface. So these represent what's happening through the majority of the depth profile. I'll bring back the PCA property page. I'll perform the same calculation and then list and scan through the list for abstract factors. So there are three and then it looks like noise. So it looks like the additional abstract factors that I found previously were related to the carbon and the surface chemistry. So at this point I think I can reproduce a significant proportion of these data here using three abstract factors rather than four or five abstract factors that I would have had to include if I'd used these top two spectra in the calculation. The fact that I could identify three abstract factors as having significant shape is useful for two reasons. First of all, the three abstract factors, while they do not look like spectra, they imply that there are three spectroscopic shapes that would represent these data. This means that I ought to be able to calculate three spectral shapes from the data set. And secondly, when we 
identify three abstract factors, that means we are assuming all other abstract factors are representative of noise. Therefore, if I choose these three abstract factors and I fit these abstract factors to the data, then the curves that are a result of these fits will be a smooth form of the data. And that's important because one of the calculations that I'm going to perform are difference spectra which will amplify noise. So if I can remove noise from the data I'm going to work on, this is a very positive thing. So to make use of this knowledge, I will reset these data so that we go back to the raw spectra. These are just the spectra without the carbon. I've specified the number of factors as three, and then pressing the predict using factors button will take the three abstract factors that I believe to be most significant and calculate curves using these three abstract factors that approximate each and every one of these spectra in the active tile. The net result ought to be data less a certain degree of noise. If I view the residual, the residual plots the difference between the processed data and the raw data. So we see that the residual standard deviation is about what we'd expect for these types of data from a pulse counted system with multiple detectors. So this reproduction step based on three abstract factors looks like it's been very successful. The spectra in the right hand side that are selected correspond to what we see in the left hand side. These are the process data but these VAMAS blocks also include the raw data. Now what I would like to do is take a copy of the process data so that I can work on the process data without fear of going back to the raw data when I undo any processing steps. So using the option on the PCA property page that says save process copy. This means that the selected VAMAS blocks in the right hand side will be listed and will be copied in the process form indicated by this tick box and it will also change the element transition field for each one of these VAMAS blocks so that in the right hand side they will appear in a separate column. So I'll press the OK button and we can see the new VAMAS blocks here. This means that I can display the process form. You can see the residual now, the processed and the raw data in these VAMAS blocks are identical, therefore there's no residual. If I step back to the original data, which still has a residual because there's processed and raw data in these VAMAS blocks, I can then reset these back to the raw state and this means that I've got raw data in this column and processed data in this column. These are the smooth data and these will be the data with noise. So now we have signal enhanced data. We can start working on these data using options on the PCA property page and the calculator property page. The first assumption that I will make is that these all lie in a plane although the PCA calculation suggested it's a cube, not a, a plane, it means that I'm selecting two spectra that I believe to be most representative of spectra within this data set. Now this is just one way of analyzing the data and there are other ways of analyzing the same data using features that I'm describing here but taking them in a different sequence and you get a different answer. So the idea is to perform some type of experiment which gives us some insight into the data rather than giving us the absolute answer. So having selected these two I'm going to overlay these in the active tile and this is in preparation for making use of the generate spectra button on the linear analysis section of the PCA property page. So I have two spectra overlaid which I think are representative of the data set or most representative of the data set. I now select all of the spectra in the process form that will then allow this option to be applied to these selected spectra based on the two spectra displayed in the active tile. And it's simply a matter of selecting the spectra, displaying two, and pressing the generate 
spectra button. It tells me that I've selected two spectra as my basis spectra, that means these two we see here, and I've also selected 34 spectra, so I will press the yes button, and the result is a file that contains four columns, the original data that was selected, so these are the process form of the data that was in the previous file, then the second column is a solution based on the third and fourth columns, meaning when the third and fourth columns are summed together in the right proportion as determined by least squares, the result is what we see in the second column, and this second column should be an approximation to what we see in the first column. So the result of the Generate Spectra button is a VAMAS file that contains on a row-by-row -row basis the original data plus the least square solution. If I overlay these four spectra in the active tile corresponding to a row, let's turn off the residual, then we see two curves, the blue one representing the data and this pink one representing the least square solution that is formed by summing these two shapes in a least square sense so that they fit the data over the entire range. And we can see there is a discrepancy here. It's not a big discrepancy, but certainly in the peak maximum there does appear to be a difference. And this shouldn't be surprising because the PCA told us that there were three dimensions, not two. If there were only two dimensions, then we would have obtained a good fit using these two spectra. Clearly not the case. And if we step through these data and we look at these data, we can see that in fact there are quite a few spectra within this list that it's not possible to fit, certainly in the peak maximum, the shape in the data by summing these two shapes in a least square sense. So what we need to do now is try and work out what additional shape is required to make a fit in a least square sense of a least square solution to the data. So I'm looking now for three curves, not two. I know from PCA there ought to be three spectral shapes to fit these data. So the question is how could I construct a new shape from what I've just done that would complete the calculation in the sense that if I take these two shapes plus the third shape, can I then reproduce all of the spectra throughout this entire profile? So to calculate the third shape, I'm going to use the calculator property page and the different spectra button. And what the different spectra button will allow me to do is to look at the difference between the data itself and the least squares fit to that data. To make use of the different spectra button, I need to display the two spectra of interest in the active tile and then press the button different spectra which will produce a new VAMAS file containing a list of spectra each representing a small incremental change between the data and the least square solution. So once we have the different spectra and this is typical of a different spectra file where the first spectrum and the last spectrum in the list are the spectra from the previous file and then the list is constructed from a sequence of small incremental changes to the first spectrum by subtracting off a small proportion of the last spectrum in this list. So as I step through this list I can observe how changes occur to these spectral shapes as we go down this list. This is a way of interrogating what it looks like when you remove one spectrum from the other in an incremental way and as I do so I come up with a spectrum which I'm not quite sure what it ought to look like but this is where the intuition based on prior knowledge comes in to choosing a spectrum. I'm looking at this spectrum and it looks like it might be a candidate so I will create a new file
copy that particular VAMAS block from the different spectra file into this file and then I'll go back to the original data because these two spectra here were used in the calculation of the linear least squares approximations to the data based on the two spectra we see here and I would like to see how these spectra relate to the one I've just calculated and here we have all three now in the same file so I can overlay and if I normalize we can have a look at the data itself so I've used a range calculation of the intensities for display purposes and it looks to me like I've got three doublet peaks here that are offset in energy so I have a, a reasonable sense that these will be linearly independent and will be the basis upon which I will then try to calculate two further shapes in addition to the one that I've just calculated that are more representative of the initial phase of this profile this pink one and the final phase which is the metallic form since this is a sputter depth profile and we're removing material from a foil of tungsten it's reasonable to assume that maybe we haven't fully removed all the oxide from the tungsten and and so this what I'm considering to be a metallic peak is not necessarily a pure metallic shape and since I've calculated something which appears to be somewhere between the original oxide state and the metallic form I think we ought to do a calculation now of how the metallic form that I have relates to the calculated oxide so if I overlay these in the active tile and create a new difference file the first one that I selected was the metallic so this appears first in the list and I can start stepping through this list and see if I can come up with a shape that I believe to be more representative of the metallic tungsten foil so as I move through this list I'm removing increasingly an amount of the newly created phase of the material that exists during the profile following etching now, I'm not quite sure what this ought to look like but I suspect it's something along these lines so this might be my guess for what metallic tungsten looks like within this measurement so let's take that through and copy it into the file that I'm collecting these different curves this is the native oxide this is the previous version of what I thought a metal peak looked like and I have created something that is quite different so let's move that one into a different column so at this point I've got now three shapes one is the one I calculated the other is the metal calculation and the first one is the spectrum corresponding to the point that I started in the profile with this calculation so let us see what needs to happen here well one of the things that might be true is that there may be some shape here that is there because of the oxide that is developing and it's already in a, a slightly developed state so I'm going to remove from the initial spectrum a proportion of the calculated spectrum and see what happens so let's do a different spectrum based on these two let's remove a proportion of the oxide phase that I've calculated and see how this peak shape changes let's close this window and that will speed up the movement of the list so I'm moving through it's making small changes and well I see some shape here I'm not quite sure if this is truly 
representative but at least I've now got a slightly different shape from my original raw spectrum well, process raw spectrum before I did any difference calculations on the data so let's go back to the list copy and, and I'm now hoping there's a difference between what I started with and what I finished with after subtracting a proportion of this first spectrum so this I'm hoping is going to be more representative of what is a phase within this de depth profile that means I want to move this one out of the way so I'm going to call that A so here I now have three shapes that I've calculated from my data now I'm not saying that these are truly physically meaningful what I'm saying is it's giving me some insight into what might be in the data and the acid test will be whether I can fit the original data with these shapes so let's go back to the original data set and I would like to have the raw data and holding the control key down I'm adding to the selection creating a new file and copying all the raw data and the three components into that file and this allows me to do a calculation let me just take off the normalization a least squares calculation based on these three shapes applied to all of the spectra that I used to calculate these three shapes Let's bring up the spectrum processing PCA property page these are my basis functions these are my target functions and I can now perform a linear analysis by pressing generate spectra three basis functions 34 target good let's do the calculation now let's see what happens when we overlay these as before lower this window and using the down arrow key I observe how the different shapes I've calculated fit very well the data in each and every one of these spectra the least square solution and the data itself overlay very nicely and they're tracing how the spectra evolve based on the three component curves that I've calculated so mathematically I can say that I've done a reasonable job in reproducing these data the real goal for XPS is not a mathematical solution the real goal is to come up with solutions that have physical meaning now whether these are physically meaningful or not I'm not sure but I do have two curves within these three components that I can sort of say one is typical of a metallic shape and the other one looks close to what might be there in the initial phases of this profile and I can see from the analysis that in order to fit all of the data in the profile I need a third shape of the nature we see here so physically meaningful perhaps mathematically meaningful yes realistically this is a way of trying to understand data you can certainly see in this case we have a shape of the data as received and it would be difficult to work out how many components are actually in these data but this analysis certainly suggests that there might be three different phases within this profile and that would be difficult to say without examining the data in the detail that's allowed by the procedures that I've illustrated in this video